Joining us uh, is uh, Harvey Liedman of Reed Smith, and uh, I'll ask uh, Harvey to uh, make the introductions and to provide some background. Just a reminder of the proposed uh, uh, schedule that we're, we're uh, going with is allowing approximately 10 minutes to talk about the uh, firm, your accomplishments, your experience, <coughs> introductions. Then there's a prepared question, and then after that, opening up to question and answer, all of which is subject to the pleasure of the board members. So, uh, Thank you very much, Brian. As just as a reminder, friendly reminder to uh, all of us in the room, uh, we do broadcast live across uh, the Internet, and these uh, proceedings are all public and will be archived, so anyone at any time would be able to retrieve all of our comments that are made in public. I just want to refresh everyone's memory that we are live that way. Okay. So even though the uh, firms are respecting the confidentiality of these and not watching the proceedings as, we, as they're uh, streaming live, they are still archived on our uh, website. Okay. Thank you. Good Was morning. With that caution, Harvey? <laughs> <laughs> so, Warren, good morning to all of you. Harvey Lederman, Reed Smith, uh, and, and delighted to be here. With me is my colleague, Sandra Poe. Sandra is uh, uh, joining us this morning because of the um, uh, importance that you put in the RFP uh, on the fiduciary side of the investment portfolio. And this uh, gives Sandra a chance to explain a little bit of her background as well, but I wanted you to get to know her uh, as well as myself, who's uh, primary fiduciary counsel, uh, so that you can really understand and, and, and ask questions about the the depth of our experience in the financial markets as, as well. And Sandra is a representative of uh, some of the top-notch people on our team that regularly provide fiduciary investment services uh, for our pension fund clients, both here in California uh, and for a number of other states and uh, municipalities as well. I'm delighted to have the opportunity um, to be with you this morning in this capacity. I feel like um, in a way, uh, we've been trying out for this role for a long time with you. Fortunately, um, we, I, I say that because we've had the opportunity to work with the board and with administrative staff, executive staff, uh, for quite some time, I think going on six years now, uh, going back to the time when Governor Schwarzenegger initiated the furloughs across the state in the last uh, a great uh, crisis that hit California, and we and this board and and others had to deal with the issues that related to um, employee rights. Uh, I'm proud of the reputation and the record that we've established throughout the state of California. It's something that we've worked hard uh, on behalf of pension funds exclusively, exclusively on behalf of the trustees of funds such as this at the state uh, and the local level, county level, city levels. Uh, and uh, f the good thing about that is, is that you don't have to take my word for anything. You, you, you have your experience with us. You have the experience of your colleagues across the state that you can call upon uh, to say, talk to us about th this firm, what they do, how they respond. Uh, their reputation for integrity in the process, what they bring to their role as fiduciary counsel, how we as fiduciary counsel can enhance your capabilities, especially at a time when um, we're facing some really significant issues. I, I want to let Sandra explain a little bit about her role in this process, and then frankly, we want to take your questions and address the things, and so we, we want to listen to what your concerns are. Um, and then try to have a, an open interchange with you to satisfy the interests that you have and what you're looking for in your fiduciary council. So, Sandra, how about a, a little bit of intro from you, too? Great. Okay, thank you, Harvey. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, very pleased. Thank you. Um, very pleased to be here talking to you this morning. Um, uh, I have the greatest respect for the role that this board plays in this uh, process uh, for CalSTRS. Um, I've spent 30 years of practice representing investment advisors, fiduciary decision makers, and institutional investors uh, in the process of making investments. Um, 
I've represented them across the board in uh, executing fiduciary responsibilities, fulfilling duties through ordinary and, and extraordinary times. Um, I have represented them in the course of making specific investment decisions and evaluating portfolios and recommendations and managers and sub-advisor contracts, uh, joint ventures, specialized portfolios, investments in traditional uh, uh, hedge, private equity, and other alternative investment type products. Um, and um, I've also represented fund sponsors uh, in setting up some of those products and in doing uh, in creating uh, special arrangements for institutional investors like yourselves uh, through direct investment in their funds or through one-off and specialized arrangements in special vehicles or through side letters. So um, uh, I'm, I'm you know, pleased to be here to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, this is the core, what your business is the core concern of my career so far, and, and I hope that we can help you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, maybe what we need to do now, if it's appropriate, is to address the um, written question. Is that the, uh, the first step? Talk about. Um, so uh, this, this question raises a, a fascinating issue, one that you deal with all, all the time. Um, and I see a number of issues on the current agenda, both at today for the board and tomorrow for the investment committee. And that's this whole idea, you know, it falls in the rubric of ESG, uh, environmental social governance. Um, it's interesting because a, a, a number of years ago when you first created um, the thought process around the ESG and led to your ESG policy, the vernacular that was used was that these were non-economic issues, non-economic issues, and how do we deal with them because our fiduciary responsibility is supposed to be to uh, do the best risk-adjusted return to the, to the system. Interestingly is that over the years and up till now, these have become front and center economic issues. And those issues are, are recognized in your ESG policy and in the risk factors, I think the, the development of the risk factors was an acknowledgement by this board that ESG issues are directly economic issues. Because as a long-term investor, as someone with a long-term horizon, as someone looking forward, a, a board whose fiduciary job is to provide benefits not only today but for the next future generations, you're looking out the economic impact um, scale. And you're saying, what is going to happen? We see these risks hitting our portfolio, possibly if not today, in the future. How are we going to address those from an economic standpoint? So we don't see this, the ESG issues in a vacuum um, by any means. And we don't see them in that classic balance uh, you know, test of, well, when can we consider non-economic social issues, if you will, uh, as distinguished from rate of return? These things impact rate of return, if not today, anticipated in the future. Uh, the question asked, um, well, how would you go about dealing with this? Um, do you do it on an ad hoc basis every time some social issue comes up or some issue like climate change or coal or something like that? Do you do it on a one-off basis and look at it on an ad hoc you know, specific, or do you set up a process? There is no question from, uh, that from a fiduciary standpoint, process is as important as result. We talk about that all the time. We talk about how it's important not for you necessarily be able to predict the future but to establish a process that gives you as a collective decision-making body the opportunity to exercise your best judgment on an issue and then the future will bring us an answer as to whether or not at the time that was a good judgment or not. But it's the process that's important and the same thing for this issue here on ESG type issue consideration. We don't need to reinvent the wheel for you. You have a process in place. You have the ESG policy. You have the risk factors. You have the engagement divestment policy in place. Those are outstanding process points that then allow you to do 
what they want you to do. It, it's an enabler. And basically the, what those policies say to you is, when an issue like this comes up, this is how we're going to approach it. It's not a one size fits all, it's a one size will help us address all, and then we're going to adjust it along the way so you have some latitude in it. So you have an objective written policy. The components of the process, the question asks, well, you know, what, what should this process include? Well, it should include substantial reliance on the investment division to identify impacts on the portfolio, to identify options. You have outside uh, opportunities. You have outside expertise available to you. I noticed on the agenda tomorrow, for example, you're going to have a presentation uh, f uh, from Bloomberg on the... Ah. He won't be tomorrow. Okay. So in the future, but, but what, I, the, the, what I noticed about it is this. We are getting more and more um, quality data being made available to test. You know, one of the things you do as fiduciaries is you not only put a policy in place, you then have an obligation to monitor it and to see is it working and to come back to it and revisit it. And, and with entities such as Bloomberg and others that have started to develop uh, verifiable data sources that are available to you to start testing the propositions and the judgment that you make. That's a tool that you can then plug back into your process and say, okay, we can use this to monitor. How are we doing? I think, for example, with tobacco, we learned after a 20-year experience of so-called pension funds divesting from tobacco, we learned a lot from that process. And we learned what worked and what didn't work. We learned that we had some unintended consequences in how those kind of things were, those divestment programs were designed, and we can learn from that. So the process is extremely important. Harvey, do you mind, did you want to have Sandra add anything? I think you yes. kind of, uh, we, I think we've gotten your gist of your response to the question. I do want to get to questions from my colleagues. Did Sandra okay. want to add to your comments at this point? There was one aspect of this, I think, from Sandra's And then I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Arntemann, who has a question. Excellent. Let Sandra Thanks. add to your comments. Thank you. Um, I, um, you know, I, I, on the point of reviewing um, your policies, I think, you know, what's really relevant is that the area around decision-making around incorporating ESG policies is undergoing vast change. Um, uh, it's already uh, last year PwC did a survey and of uh, 7.6 trillion dollars of institutional investors who are invested in this space and 73 percent of them uh, considered uh, ESG factors important towards portfolio risk mitigation and 53 percent cited financial performance as a significant reason why they review these factors um, and uh, you know industry practice common industry practice is often an important factor in considering where you believe the state of your practices are to consider uh, where industry practices are. And so you can just see by this one survey the fact that the, the UN PRI initiative has been uh, increased, the signers have increased from 560 signers in 2009 to 1,200 signers in 2014, representing $34 trillion of assets. In addition, I mean, on the legal side, we see a really a development in the consideration of what is material. What does materiality mean, especially in ESG fact, considering ESG factors? Um, the relevance of ESG factors to financial performance is becoming, you know, more and more acknowledged by regulators around the world, frankly. Um, in particular, just starting with the United States, of course, under Dodd-Frank, we had uh, new laws related to conflict minerals disclosures and the disclosures of payments made to governments by uh, companies in those industries. Um, in addition, recently the SEC had published an interpretive release on how existing disclosure rules, nothing new, existing disclosure rules are implicated by cl climate change alone as an example of a factor. Um, I think it's, it's becoming acknowledged that the uh, guidelines that the SEC articulated in the climate change arena um, <coughs> are good principles that can be used um, to uh, 
evaluate when ESG factors become financial factors relevant to your investment decision making. Um, in particular, they talked about uh, the importance under existing rules that companies need to disclose um, when the uh, impact of law and regulation and pending changes in law and regulation might impact a company's financial performance, um, the impact of treaties and international accords. Companies have to disclose whether legal, technological, political, or scientific developments known or anticipated create uh, new opportunities or risks for the company's financial performance. Um, and they need to consider whether, uh, for example, in climate change, whether actual and potential material impacts of the physical effects of climate change would affect their operations and financial resources. So uh, I mean, I have some other examples, but I know you're trying to move on. But um, just to make the point that, that uh, it, it is increasingly being recognized, including by global regulators, including by also even bigger initiatives in the EU, that uh, ESG factors are financial performance factors. And I think everyone's on a learning curve, regulators included, about how companies and investors need to reflect that in their decisions. Thank you both. Uh, let, let me get to questions sure. from my colleagues at this point and see if we can get a little bit of exchange going. Mr. Unterman. Uh, thanks. Thank you. That, and that was a very good presentation. Um, I've got a couple questions about this area, uh, but let me start with the first, which is picking up on what what uh, uh, Sandra was just talking about. Um, the great bulk of our portfolio is passive, uh, and we do have discrete programs addressing ESG. Um, if we were to determine that the returns, uh, well, there are two questions there. One, uh, does this mean that ESG is becoming discounted into the market, and as a way, and, and therefore we can see ourselves as being responsive that way? And second, how do we deal with specific ESG type programs that we establish if we find over a period of time that performance lags? We may think that in 2023 that'll be the place to be, but today performance is lagging. Why don't you take the first question? I'll take the second. Okay. Um, so, on whether it's being read into the market now, um, ESG. I think there are a lot of studies on this point, and obviously it behooves the board to stay on top of what the studies are saying. Right. Um, from in, uh, to the extent that I, I'm following this, and I'm uh, my view is that. In the United States, because disclosure on these points, although the SEC has issued this guidance, corporate disclosures on these points are not necessarily fully reflected in uh, corporate reporting just yet. The EU has some policies that already require companies with over 500 employees to report on the influence of ESG factors on their financial performance. Um, and about 2,500 companies already do that in Europe. And by 2017, seven, all 7,000 companies that are covered will have to do this, including reporting down their supply chain. So I think you're going to have, at that point, you're probably going to see a huge leap in the market being able to absorb and discount for um, ESG performance factors. But I'm not, I, I doubt yet whether it's so uniformly implemented by corporate reporters that uh, it's uniformly reflected in stock prices. It's still, it's okay. still. Yeah. the bailiwick of forward-thinking investors to push that. The, the second question about what happens if you set policy and then in 2023 it turns out the world looks different. Well, no, it's the reverse. I mean, it's right, right now we're dealing with, uh, is, let's assume we're looking at assets that are underperforming. A program that underperforms our return objective, underperforms uh, broad markets, uh, but is predicted to put you in a better place seven years from now. You know, the, the, the board is in the prediction business to a large extent. Mm -hmm. uh, we predict our liabilities. Mm -hmm. Mortality rates is a good example of that. And we predict our assets, what markets are going to do, um, is part of that. Um, you have risk recognitions built in to acknowledge that uh, things change and that you could underperform in one area, overperform in the other area. I mean, what that means is that in predicting these kind of things as well, um, you have to do essentially a true up every so often. And, and one of the things that I think we might look at in terms of the um, policy um, is to put a temporal um, 
touchstone in there somewhere that says, you know what, here's what we're, you know, we're, right now we're experiencing this in the portfolio, we're anticipating something different or maybe something different comes along. We have to keep doing sort of a true up. We have to do an acknowledgement and look at where are we as, it go, as, as these markets go forward and as our expectations change, as performance change. Uh, everybody has seen that wonderful periodic chart of investments that the investment managers put up all the time and they show it's real estate one year and it's private equity another year and it's global assets another year. Um, you make judgments based on that, but every year it's gonna come out differently. So part of, part of the fiduciary process is to constantly be truing up your understanding of, of the impact on your portfolio and making adjustments, course adjustments as you go forward. Okay, can I ask a, a different tack on this? Um, I was in another meeting last week where fiduciary in a different setting, and um, our counsel informed us of a decision by the Delaware Supreme Court in the corporate setting that said that ESG factors should not be considered when uh, total return or, or return to investors is, cons is, is, uh, is the issue or the objective. Um, and you know the Delaware Supreme Court isn't the California Supreme Court, um, but it was a pretty strong statement. Uh, and our trust counsel said this bears on trustee obligations. Or thinking, I don't know if you're familiar with the case, whether you have a point of view on that or uh, or not. Um, Delaware has never been exactly on the forefront of fiduciary responsibilities. Delaware law allows, allows managers, for example, to waive all fiduciary responsibilities to you as investors. Um, I, I would not say, I, I would say there is such a robust federal, uh, from ERISA and non-ERISA law on this subject um, that, that that decision uh, is out of step with the responsibilities that this board has to its members and beneficiaries. Thank you. Um, so uh, that leads to a corollary question, and that is, um, how do you view our ability to, uh, to protect ourselves by relying on opinion of our counsel? You know, there's a California Supreme Court decision that says um, for municipal officials, uh, it's, it, you're not absolutely protected simply by saying you relied on counsel. Mm -hmm. So what do you get from counsel? Um, what you get from counsel, uh, hopefully, is sound judgment and good reasons for recommendations that you take into consideration as a fiduciary, along with the other input that you get, and, and along with your own good judgment and common sense. And you exercise that collectively. It's not each one of you, but collectively this board, board acts. And what you get is not a get out of jail free card from saying, well, I listened to my counsel, my counsel told me what the law is. But you get the defense of proper exercise of prudent judgment. It's prudent for you to talk to people who are experts in the field. It's prudent for you to talk to a number of people and to form your own judgment and to do that in an open and public forum where other stakeholders get to bring in Delaware Supreme Court cases and things like that and test what you're relying on and then make a collective prudent judgment on that basis. If you do that, the courts will give you great deference to the exercise of your judgment. That is the essence of exercising discretion. And the courts want you to do that. They want you to do it collectively. So I can't give you a get out of jail free card, but we can give you the best judgment. Any counsel can, I say I, but any counsel can give you their best judgment tested by experience and tested by, frankly, common sense. And then it's up to you to exercise your judgment and, and make d decisions on that basis. Great. Can I, uh, Harry, can I ask the one last question I have, uh, which is 
Uh, I don't know if you were here yesterday at our governance committee meeting. I, I think was not. You, oh, you weren't. Okay. So we had a long discussion uh, about the 72 different reports we get and uh, the rather congested meeting calendar we have and the sense that we're not spending our meeting time on the three or four most uh, crucial or, or most important or far-reaching questions. Um, how would you see your role in helping us call the agenda, separate the wheat, wheat from chaff, et, et, et cetera? Um, I'm gonna, I'd put that in one word, focus. I think it's very important for us as counsel, given the, Justice Holmes once said, if only as a concession to the shortness of life, you have to draw a line somewhere. You get inundated with an enormous amount of data and I think our conversation yesterday about fiduciary insurance was a, an example. What I ha had hoped to bring to the board during that situation was some focus. Here are the specific issues that you need to focus on. You've relied upon your staff and your outside consultants, and in that case, your broker, to chew through a lot of data and to present you with a lot of data, not to filter it. But then when it comes to your precious time on the dais, and the time that you have collectively together to have an intelligent conversation, this precious time that you have, the best that I can do, the best that we can do for you, and the same thing on the investment side, is to bring you focus. Say, these are the three things that we think are most important to you. Let's talk about those things. Um, I, I don't envy, I've seen the briefing books. I, I know what the binders look like for your meetings. It's like that for every pension fund up and down this state and other states. Thank you, thank you, Harvey. I, what, what I'd like to do um, is, with respect, Paul, I, I'd like to come back to you, uh, one of our colleagues is, is uh, looking to get on the queue here to follow up on. Oh. Yeah, here we go. Uh, Irena. Thank you. Ms. Ortega. So sorry to jump ahead, but I just so want to okay. get it's on, on this, on point. this yeah. specific point. So I, I think your your point about focus is right. And I want to know how will you tell us what to focus on? Are you going to um, tell us in a meeting? So I, I want to get to the how. How do you help us um, see what we should be focusing on? Um, first of all, I need to learn from you what your desire is, what your expectations and wish list is in that regard. What we've done in other situations is, and, and I think this, you, you get some of this now with, from internal staff as well. Uh, we could focus for you, if this is what you're looking for, with a, a cover memorandum, a brief memorandum relating to each particular issue that's appropriate for fiduciary counsel to weigh in on, and say, these are the issues we think the board needs to deal with in this particular item? Um, I've, in other board meeting situations, I've advised many uh, mutual fund boards and other private fund boards, for example. You know, executive summaries are often helpful. And in addition, uh, we have a, a very large firm with a lot of resources, including knowledge management resources. And depending on what you communicated to us was your need to focus down the, the large amount of material to smaller amounts, you know, to more digestible format and direct you to the most important points, you know, we may have other resources in the firm that we could bring to bear um, to assist with that uh, uh, prioritizing endeavor. Another technique that we've used with some of our boards is to uh, have a pre-call with the chair, vice chair, and sometimes past chair, or, you know, it doesn't really matter, but talk with the chair and the vice chair. Uh, uh, about what's on the agenda and what needs to be presented and focused on each agenda item. Uh, and that's done some, you know, frequently in a, in a pre-meeting call um, with, with the, the CEO and the chair and the vice chair to really kind of focus on what that presentation is going to look like and how much time. I mean, I, I think a lot of this is going on right now, but maybe not so much with fiduciary counsel. And that is one of the things that we do do for our clients. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Mr. Rosenstiel. 
Thanks. A couple of questions. First of all, following up on the ESG discussion and, and Tom's question about whether uh, the prices, uh, the prices are already you know, implicit in the market and therefore we're considering them because we're passive investors. And I appreciate all of your discussion about the, the number of investors who are focused on ESG issues. Of course, we, we live under the state of California constitution and what it says about California pension funds, which is probably not what most of those other investors are live under. So I, I'd like a response in, in the context of what the state constitution here says. So how would we as a board look at this question of stranded assets? So on the one hand, there are people who say investment in fossil fuel companies is guaranteed to lead to a loss because of the stranded assets and the stranded assets um, are currently being valued as real assets as opposed to stranded assets in the market. And others who would say, including those who would promote the fundamental <coughs> investment um, uh, policy that we implement, which is that there's a fairly efficient market, and that's why we are broad, passive investors, that there's no investor who is smarter than another investor in the long run, and, and therefore that if, if there's no reason for us to be smarter than the other guy in understanding that the stranded assets mean there's no value. If we're smart enough to figure that out, everybody else is smart enough to figure that out, um, and therefore it is priced into the market. So how would you advise us on on that kind of an, of an issue as fiduciaries under the state constitution when there are, you know, potentially very legitimate views on both sides of this, of this valuation argument? I'm going to leave the California constitutional issue to Harvey, but I will say that um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of, there are a lot of different type of investors that are moving large amounts of money into the marketplace, so not all of them are doing it based on a fundamental analysis. There are many index type vehicles and other types of trading programs that are moving money into companies because of algorithmic index market representation factors that are not fundamental to the point of whether stranded assets are being properly valued in a particular company's portfolio. Um, I think it was Warren Buffett who said, I've made most of my fortune by being getting out too early. Um, so that I think there is value to be had in being in, in focusing on things that you think are important to focus on in terms of the valuations of particular companies uh, and whether you think their portfolios are properly valued. Um, whether that intelligence can be better or faster than other investors, I don't know, but def definitely you know, there are people looking at, at a lot of that now, and you as a large investor have great access to great experts and even to management to, qu to question what they think uh, about their valuation practices on these stranded assets. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think one should give up on, on, on being early, um, being, uh, thinking critically and potentially being early on some of these companies. Um, so yeah, well, that's not my question. Um, my, my question is: is how do we? We may think we're right. Um, some of us may think we're, we we can do that better than others. There's a diversity of opinion on this board as to as to whether we should be active or passive mm -hmm. investors. But how do we how do we build the the case that we're meeting our fiduciary duty when we're trying to predict the future? And there's and there's there's a lot of diversity of opinion about what the future will hold. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll say one more thing, and then I'll see to Harvey on the California constitutional issue. But I think creating the record that you've con that you are aware of the different points of view, that you've considered the route, the different routes before you've chosen the route to uh, look at fundamentals and valuations and management practices versus um, the greater wisdom of the marketplace having priced this already. I think in. Uh, I've had many situations where I've been an opportunity to advise boards and just echoing what Harvey said before, having the proper record of having done the proper inquiry and um, is, is a great safety factor 
a great protector of boards and fiduciaries uh, in why they made the ultimately make the decisions that they make. Um, so I think just having a very good record of how you're making decision and of looking at all the factors uh, and all the inputs that you and deciding what relevance and weight you this board decides or your investment managers decide to give to that uh, those different sources of information uh, is is your protection. I don't think your protection relies on absolutely having gotten it right with 2020 hindsight. That can never really be the standard for any investor, professional or otherwise. Yeah, the, the, the you know it, the California Constitution does not give us a comfort letter if we do certain things and not other things. The the constitutional um, requirement is that you engage as a prudent expert, not a prudent man, but a or a woman or a prudent person, a prudent expert. And, and to be a prudent expert, you know, the rest of the phrase in the Constitution is to do under the circumstances then prevailing what is prudent and appropriate. The best we can do is look at the circumstances now prevailing, get the best expertise that we can gather and make a judgment call based on that. There's, there's nothing that says that if you do a certain thing that you're going to be insulated uh, or you have this comfort that you've done it right. You've done it right if you've done it as a prudent expert would have done under the circumstances. For what purpose, though? For the purpose of maximizing the risk-adjusted return okay, so that's, to that's, the system. That's, it's all about that? It is all about that. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. So let me ask a, 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 another question, getting back to our favorite topic that we've worked on, Harvey, for the last few months of fiduciary insurance. So um, so at, as fiduciary counsel, well, you know, you understand the history of this item. And the, and the item really came to the attention of the board because of our prior fiduciary counsel, where it was not a matter of of a legal opinion. It was a matter that, that, that he took it upon himself to raise to the board a concern that he had that we weren't adequately protected by the insurance that was in place. Um, would you have seen that as your role to, to have alerted us to that in a similar, had you been fiduciary counsel? Yes, and clearly, because the protection of this board, and this was something I was going to comment yesterday, and we didn't really have time to go into it, but the protection of this board is a fundamental um, fiduciary responsibility and appropriate cost of administration of this system. Not exposing the board members individually to potential liability and cost as you carry out your fiduciary responsibilities is an extremely important aspect of the administration of the pension system and in yours to the benefit of your constituents. In fact, all stakeholders. Uh, you cannot ask a diverse board like this, some of whom are ex officio uh, public officials, some of whom are put on the board through constituents, you can't ask um, people to serve in this capacity without knowing that they have some protections from potential liability. It would absolutely have been my responsibility to bring that to your attention, to evaluate the fiduciary insurance coverage <coughs> through the lens of what is in the best interests of this system. As, as, and, and you're acting as a fiduciary board, not on your own personal behalf. The, the, the people of California have already said they want, the law already says you're entitled to make these decisions even though they affect your personal liability issues. So that's, that's not an issue here. It's a fiduciary issue, and yes, it, it would Thank certainly you, be. Thank you. Can I just follow up? Because I'm not quite sure that Go ahead. You, an you answered my question. I'm, I appreciate and I agree with you that having the coverage that we're talking about is, is, is appropriate. But I'm talking about what you would have seen your role is because, because staff was, was not 
staff was not telling us we needed better coverage. Staff had delivered the coverage we had, and 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 it it took it took fiduciary counsel to to say you the board and and Calsters the system should have more. And so I'm asking whether you would have would, whether you would have done that or whether you see it that as as your role if if it's not just a this a, a disagreement about legal opinions but it's but it's a feeling that our fiduciary that we're not being protected as fiduciaries do you feel you have a, a responsibility to come directly to the board to alert us to that absolutely okay thank you Ms. Hendricks so I had a follow-up question actually connected to, to Paul's question and then I wanted to get back to the ESG question um, and that is I, I do know um, in in past board conversations we've had questions around the role of a fiduciary council and then the role of our general council and I just wondered if could you tell us how you see those roles as being different and how they interact and how you see a fiduciary council operating and their scope of practice if you will um, sure. versus the general council this is a very symbiotic relationship between outside fiduciary council and, and um, executive or staff council. Uh, we, uh, as um, members of the California Bar, we are not only fiduciaries uh, to you, as you are fiduciaries to the members, but we also have client relationship obligations that are imposed on us as members of the bar. And in most instances, a general counsel is there uh, to provide expertise on the operations of the system and to um, assist the administration in vetting legal issues that relate to how, how the system is administered. Part of the value added from fiduciary counsel is that um, we represent more than a single client. We represent pension boards throughout the United States. We represent many pension boards in the state of California under California law and we can bring perspectives that are not available directly to your in-house legal staff. So we augment each other in that respect. In with most of the general counsel offices that I work with, the relationship is extremely cooperative uh, ex because we're all working for the same client, this board for example. Um, on the other hand, there are times when we bring a completely different perspective uh, to, the, um, to the operation and directly to you. We are your direct counsel. Harvey, right, we're pushing up against a time constraint. We want to be respectful of uh, making sure that we let all of the uh, presenters have the same amount of time. So oh. I'm going to ask Sharon to ask her final question, yes. and then you need to wrap it up real uh, quickly. And I, I say that respectfully. To, to you as well as your, uh, your the other folks that are interviewing with us. Does so anyone thank else you. want to ask a question? Okay. So, go ahead, Sharon. So my, my follow-up, quite a different question. So, so thank you. Sure. That was great. Um, but when you talked about the Constitution and talking about under the circumstances then prevailing, um, given even just this, this week's board meetings, you know, things are changing. And I just wondered how... As our fiduciary counsel, how would you have any recommendations for modifications or changes in our divestment policy or our 21 risk factors or, or any of our policies? Um, and, and could you give an example of, of maybe one thing you would change or modify given the climate that we're in now, trying to think about how to be um, sort of thoughtful and forward thinking, but, but staying true to this you know, sort of risk-adjusted return and our mandate as fiduciaries, and yet, um, you know, some of the challenges that we f face on, on the ESG issues. And I just wonder if... I, I Harvey, a, you I need have. to do it like in about two minutes. Nice little <laughs> basket for us, please. I only say that because I want to <laughs> no honor pressure. the process, and I think as attorneys, you understand the importance of us making sure Appreciate process it. is followed. And, and, and Thank you. I, I, I don't want to give a lot of legal advice uh, on this issue in right. public, but let me, let me point out one thing that I think that we could have a conversation about on the 
risk policy, the, the risk in the ESG policy, and that is uh, consider a temporal <laughs> element, an element of time. There's nothing in the current policy that really talks about revisiting where we are when we trigger the policy. In other words, it's open-ended. Now, you don't want to telegraph to the markets that you're going to sell in any particular period of time. Understand that. On the other hand, it, we might want to have a conversation about what are our touchdowns? When are we coming back? When are we going to revisit? When are we going to see how we trigger the policy? Now, when are we going to come back and talk about how are we doing? How is engagement working for us? How is it not working for us? Where are we going to go then? Because those circumstances change. And so uh, if I could make a suggestion, I would say one of the things I'd like to talk about in the policy is putting a temporal component where the board tests the water, takes the temperature, whatever analogy you want to use, to say, how is this working for us now, and do we want to make mid-course adjustments going forward? Thank you. And uh, just uh, before you leave, it, should your firm be fortunate enough to be selected by this board, what role would Sandra play? Would she be in the boardroom with us, or would it always be with you, Harvey? What role, <laughs> if any, would Sandra play? What do you want? Um, <laughs> um, I, or is that I, to I'm, be determined? Harvey's going to have to say on that, but I do want to say I have many years of, of experience counseling boards during deliberations. Um, I, I have represented management. I have represented independent trustees. I have represented... Uh, it, management trustees and, and management executives and um, you know if I had the privilege of being in your boardroom and counseling you from uh, you know I, just to your question Sharon um, so much good can come of making sure that there are different points of view that are well supported and responsibly and and with integrity worked out between you know there, there's a reason why independent board members are in different types of organizations mm -hmm. and uh, doing that kind of a, uh, having that kind of a productive dialogue between management and independent uh, board oversight is uh, one of the most valuable processes to everyone involved uh, when everyone has the same stake in, in having a quality result. Thank you both very much for being with us today. Thank, Thank you, you for very the much. opportunity. We Thank very you. much appreciate it. Thanks so much. Comments, thoughts. Tom, better. better. <laughs> much, much, much better. I mean, those yeah. are real lawyers, They're... which is important. Wow. This is, a, this is an open session. Yeah. They're, they're scholarly lawyers. They know the law. They know the state law. They're strong. And they know how to apply it to our setting. I didn't mean to. No, uh, we didn't. I was just more like <laughs> open session. <laughs> no, abs ab absolutely. It wasn't. It wasn't I'm taken that way at all, Tom. No. We, we understand. You're that. a lawyer, absolutely. So I appreciate yeah, expertise. Betty, yeah. Betty. Yeah. Your breadth is much deeper and expansive, and uh, I particularly like the experience they'd have with uh, other pension systems that I think could be a real asset. I mean, just really hands-on and and uh, could be very beneficial to issues for us. Thanks. His side is very... Uh, <laughs> Contemplative. Quiet. Quiet. Okay. I, just, I would just say I think, I think the, they, they bring an understanding of investments too, which I think yeah. is yeah. important to us because I think yeah. having uh, an understanding of investments and investment theory as we're trying to struggle with some of these issues I think uh, is, is going to be useful to us. Uh, Grant, thanks. That's what you called on this side. I, what I have to say doesn't really bear on our deliberations other than, wow, it's really difficult for an interview, um, you know, to, to, really, to really judge and understand the work that they would do for us. I'm not sure there's a better process, but, you know, that's my observation. Anyone else want to chime in? Sharon? I, I did actually. I thought um, 
their answers to some of our <clears throat> the ESG questions too. I, I felt like it it felt like the sort of the critical looking at it at all angles conversation. I, I felt like they seemed also equipped to to help us um, thoughtfully tackle some of those questions. I think you know the state constitution question. I thought they handled that well, and I still have some questions around that. Um, but I I thought they seemed equipped to be able to help help us with some of our thinking. Um, um, Arena? Yeah, I generally agree with everything that's been said, and I this is more a comment about the board, and we've had these discussions in our self-evaluation, but one thing that struck me, and I thought their responses around process and helping us understand what process we need to go through were very good, but I also thought that we've had uh, varying levels of satisfaction with our consultants and with our advice given, and so we need to be clear about what we want from them and then tell okay. them, how do you want us right. to how do you want us to help you because i think sometimes we're not we're not giving them the people presenting to us as much direction as we could so i think we should think about that as well and you're you're exactly spot on the, uh, this afternoon joy and i can have a little uh, chat with uh, one of our senior staff persons and one of our consultants so we can give direct feedback as to what we really want uh, them to give us in presentation so you are i think that's with a, a new with a new contract it's a great opportunity good opportunity mm -hmm. Sharon, I, I just I got I just want to say thank you, Irina, for bringing that up because I do I thought even your question, you know, um, to Harvey about how he can help us. I do think we need to be clear, and I think we have been yesterday. But I do, I do think we have to say this is how we you know this is what we need for the next board meeting to feel like we're running an efficient meeting with the content that we need. Help us get there, and I think um, so. I, I do think. You know, I think we're getting there, but I think we do need to direct our consultants, and in, in particular with our fiduciary attorney. So I, I you're spot on. I have a, uh, a question, but I'm going to go to Tom <laughs> first. Yeah. Tom, I was just going to comment. I, I thought he handled Irena's question really well. Yeah. Because not only did he say, "Well, collaborate," but here's how I will do it, exactly. and this is how I've done it someplace else, and which is what you want. And I really believe if we ask him to do just that sort of coordination and give that sort of guidance as to what he thinks the board should be doing, yeah. he'll do it, and he'll do it forcefully. So I, I thought that was good. It was um, tangible, like I, an executive summary. Oh, by the way, I should just say, I also really like the way he handled the Delaware law question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he, yeah he so I have, I, I have a, a question. Um, regardless of whom the board determines will serve as our fiduciary counsel, do we have the ability to uh, direct whom we want from the firm to, to be in the room? For example, if we want one of the attorneys that has been before us this morning to spend more time with us so that we can get to know that person a little bit more than somebody we may already be familiar with, do we have that ability to do that, Brian? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. The only limitation would be, and it wouldn't be much of a limitation, is if they had someone new that was not on the contract and we right. didn't have a billing rate. But we can handle that very quickly. I'd ask for us to really be thoughtful about that because some of these folks we already know and we have relationships with and they have a presence with us, but their their firm has a, uh, a deeper bench and there might be other folks that uh, whose voices they have, you know, obviously they're in the same firm so they're aligned. It might be helpful for us to expand who we get exposure to, whomever we decide is going to be serving us in the future. Tom? Yeah. I, I, your question spurred a thought uh, of mine on, uh, on the contract itself that I think will be important, that we ought to provide for broad enough staffing so that if we are going to ask them to really vet board material and stuff like that, that it's not just Harvey and Sandra at very expensive billing rates looking at all this, but that they can have, they can have staff support, uh, paralegal and, and associates, doing some of that work and helping them. And yeah. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so we'll take uh, five minutes and bring in the next firm. Good morning. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ryan, you want to introduce everyone for us? Um, i introduce uh, Marcus Wu. Marcus will be uh, the lead attorney on the representation. He's with Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw. And uh, um, just a reminder of the, uh, of the format. Uh, we've asked uh, 
Council to uh, do introductions, provide some background. Um, we've allotted approximately 10 minutes. Don't, uh, feel free to adjust that. And then uh, you have a prepared question uh, that we'd at, like you to respond to, and then question and answer period. So with that, Marcus, would you introduce your team and, uh, and tell us something about yourselves? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about our firm, and then we'll each go into um, you know, giving you some a little bit of uh, information about our individual backgrounds. Um, so Pillsbury is a full full service law firm. We have uh, approximately 700 lawyers, and we're based in uh, many cities throughout the United States. In California. We have offices in San Francisco, uh, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and San Diego. And um, our practice areas, the firm's practice areas, covers uh, multiple areas, including SEC issues, finance, real estate, private equity, investments, which Dulcie will speak a little bit about, and of course, litigation. Um, so we really do have a, a very wide um, swath of expertise. The group that will be primarily responsible for representing the board is our employee benefits group, and we are members of the group. There are 19 members in the United States. Uh, we represent companies and public agencies of all sizes, ranging from you know very large companies and huge municipalities to you know, sm sole proprietorships and uh, lo small local water districts. Um, stirs for. Um, Pillsbury would be a top priority. Um, so far, we've identified five people who would be primarily responsible uh, to the, for this work. The three of us at the table, along with another person, a senior counsel and an associate. So what that enables us to do is devote you know, substantial resources to representing the board, and we commit to things like same-day responses on calls and emails and so forth. Um, a little bit about my background. Um, I've been an employee benefits lawyer for 18 years, and during that period, I've represented public agencies and private companies, not only in fiduciary matters, but also um, operational matters, tax matters, basically the, a huge range of legal issues relating to employee benefits. So I'm familiar not only with the fiduciary aspects of how plans work, but also the operational, administrative, and tax side. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to Dulcie. Good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm Dulcie Brand. I'm a partner in our Los Angeles office. I've practiced in corporate and securities work for more than 30 years, and I've represented public pension plans for 20 years. My work for public pension plans is primarily in alternative investments, but I also advise on kind of all aspects of investment programs. Um, and I am on the executive board of the National Association of Public Pension Attorneys, which is an organization you may be familiar with that um, is devoted to educating uh, the lawyers for public pe pension plans, both in-house and outside counsel. Good morning. My name is Amber Ward. I am a senior associate in the benefits group at Pillsbury Winthrop. I've been a benefits attorney for about eight years now, and I represent public employers and private agents, public agencies in all aspects of benefit plan administration and fiduciary compliance. Uh, my career has been split between New York and California, so I've had the opportunity to work at, with a lot of different clients and at different law firms and have had exposure to clients in a lot of different industries and a lot of different risk tolerances, which provides a lot of nice reference points for addressing different problems and, and issues. Well, we can move to the prepared question now. And um, what, what I'd like to start with is just a short answer. Um, our, our short answer to your question is that um, standardized processes provide a roadmap for reasoned decision making, which is what's required under your fiduciary duty of prudence. So presuming you receive a request, again, that's not related to purely financial concerns, at least not on the surface, that warrants a response, presuming that request warrants a response, our recommendation would be to follow your existing uh, standard processes, which are robust, um, with a caveat. And the caveat is, 
are the existing processes adequate for addressing the particular request? If they are, run the issue through the process. If they aren't, then um, it may be time to consider an ad hoc determination. And we'll explain how we reached our conclusion. So the guiding principles for all your decisions really are the fiduciary duties under uh, the California Constitution, the Education Code, and California Trust Law. And the, the question we got really sort of re referenced the potential effect of a request you get on your investments. And that, that implicates, in our view, sort of two key requirements. One, again, it's your duty of prudence, which requires whatever process you use uh, to evaluate all relevant facts and circumstances and make a reasoned decision based on that assessment. But another duty is a duty to follow your plan policies. Uh, unless doing so violates another fiduciary duty. And again, you have 18 robust, detailed policies governing investments. And specific to ECG concerns, we think that the 21 risk factor policy in your divestment policy would be relevant. Yeah, we, we have looked at your policies and think that they provide a, a, a really good roadmap for satisfying your fiduciary duties and, and uh, addressing these issues. You know, you would evaluate your policies and how they applied to the issue at hand, including the risk factors, and it's something that you would have to do to, to meet your fiduciary duties um, and consider all the facts and circumstances that, that are there. If your policies are not, if following your policies doesn't provide what you want, you may need to consider other things, including, you know, addressing using particular experts on a particular situation or going to another ad hoc determination. Um, one of the considerations there might be, well, if your policies don't address what you are looking at, is it time to consider changing your policy or updating a policy as they're not necessarily static at any time? Um, there also may be a, a, a call to take no action, on, and that may be the right decision at the time. And of course, documenting your process is extremely important to show that you are following your duty of prudence and being deliberative. And oftentimes, that provides the basis in the event years from now, if there is a uh, litigation that you have documented your process and to look into that you've followed a very specific process and have showed your prudence and you know oftentimes the decision that you make it doesn't have to be right five years or ten years from now if say an investment you chose didn't end up performing as well as you thought it would but if it was a good choice at the time and you can document that you had a thoughtful process then then that'll protect you in the future um, it looks like you have very um, thoughtful processes and that you do a wonderful job documenting your processes. So in choosing investment decisions, you should follow your processes. Um, and in instances where you may go have to follow an ad hoc approach and go outside of your, po your existing policies, then it's very important to document why you're deviating from your policies, the thought that was given to that, and to be able to have a basis um, later on to show why you made those choices. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do now is uh, go to some of the questions that my colleagues have. Uh, let's see if we can get a little exchange of uh, ideas going back and forth. Sure. Okay. With that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Dillon. So my comments are, uh, or my question is not necessarily on the hypothetical that you were given, but on the write-up that we received. Um, there were a couple of um, comments about, uh, so like in, uh, when we were talking about um, review written meeting materials and attend all the meetings, it was in that section. And, and when you were talking about, and I realized that you don't, you've not ever interacted with our board before, and so you really don't have much of experience with how we perform or how we act. So please take my comments in that kind of light. Um, that in closed session that you would lead the discussion and advise the board requesting board input as necessary and then that you would schedule a call with staff to discuss any items that stem from that meeting 
And then in another one, um, that you should develop and maintain positive relationships with the board and staff, it was you talk about becoming deeply integrated with the staff's day-to-day -day responsibilities. So I have to say both those phrases gave me pause. I know, I, I, I want to give you the opportunity to address what my concern might be. Our fiduciary council works for us, and sometimes uh, there isn't a very clear delineation for us of how much involvement there is with staff and then how much involvement there is with us. So could you just talk about that a little bit? I... That, that, you know, when we spoke with uh, Brian and the others at our first meeting, it became clear to us. Uh, it, it refined our understanding of what our role would be. So when we were preparing our response, you know, our, our, the message was, you know, we've done, we've served that type of role before where we've, you know, sort of been more in Brian's role serving as general counsel, interacting with staff, interacting with the board. It became clear to us after that first meeting that really that's not what you had in mind here, that really our role is to serve the board. And so th that clarified for us that, no, you know, the, there probably be, would be limited interaction with staff. We probably have most of our contact with the board and with the general counsel. And, you know, we're certainly willing to follow the board's lead on this too, okay. you know, as it becomes more clear on what our responsibilities are. Brian, yeah. a lot of these responses then were from before the initial meeting. They're like the first set of questions they were that Yes, were this was their response to the RFI. There were Great. no further written responses. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mr. I appreciate that. Thank, sure. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Unterman? Yeah, uh, I have two, uh, a couple questions, but let me uh, stay on this one first. I don't know if you were here yesterday or tracked what we we had a long discussion in our governance committee meeting about the fact that we get 72 or three or 500 some very large number of reports uh, every meeting and uh, and uh, and we find ourselves with agendas that uh, are not focused or pointed on the most important things that we we should be doing and so my question is, how do you see your role in helping us call that, uh, make sure we're talking about the right things at the right time, um, and things like that? Well, maybe I could go back to uh, Ms. Dillon's question. So I, I'm assuming our role here uh, as your fiduciary counsel would also would include helping formulate the agenda yeah. and prioritizing items on the agenda. So if that presumption is correct, um, it, it I think what you're asking is how would we work to prioritize what's on the list? Yeah, and, what, yeah, and, and, and yeah, yeah, just how, how would you do it? What, what processes would you put in place to make sure you're, you're doing that? Well, you know, we, I think we have pretty good judgment. So we, we would put the most important items on the, on the list and focus on those. Right. And understand that the board is limited you know, amount of time, you know, we have a limited amount of uh, time here that you can meet. Mm -hmm. So we would take those into consideration and work with your general counsel to um, really identify items that can be, uh, that need to be addressed, that have to be addressed, and that deserve the focused attention. But in the past, when we've prepared agendas, one thing we found very helpful is also consulting with uh, the board chair before the meeting. And if we had that opportunity, we think that would go a long way to helping us refine the agenda before the meeting. Do you have anything to add to that? And I think over time, I think you get to know the board and how it, what it regards as important because that's, that's, those are the things you want to spend your time on. And getting a sense of the board and the board's desires is, is something that will take a little time, but something that, you know, we would certainly work for. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how, how would the work flow be pro uh, structured would we see one two three uh, uh, three of you uh, uh, at meetings or I think it depends I mean my uh, the the first the the initial stage are my plan is to be at every meeting mm -hmm. and then if there if there's an area and also I'd hope to bring Amber who'd be my primary backup mm -hmm. and if there are areas that neither of us um, are experts in for example Dulce is an investment investment and investments, expert in investments. So if the meeting primarily involved investments, then you know I and Dulcie would come, and that and then we um, refine it as time went by. You know, as we get a better understanding of your needs, we'd be able to allocate the, the specific resources. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, let me shift gears a little bit. Um, in terms of protections for us as trustees, what do you what do you see the fundamental package to be, and what should what would you be looking at to make sure we're as covered as we should be? Can you help me refine that question a little bit? Do you have any specific concerns? This document's referring specifically to fiduciary insurance. Well, in insurance, indemnity agreements, how the way boards are protected generally. Um, you do have an insurance policy, right? Um, so It's a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I believe your statutes permit indemnification as well. I, I'm not sure to what extent uh, mm -hmm. those statutes have been invoked, but insurance policy, we would certainly, we always recommend to fiduciaries that you have an insurance policy and that it's broad and that it, it, it's worded um, to give you the broadest possible protections. And uh, if we were asked to look at your fiduciary insurance uh, policies, probably what we would do is we would look at it from a California law standpoint and from a benefits standpoint, but also have the folks in our uh, insurance group vet the contract to make sure it's adequate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Let me swing back, and this will be my last question, uh, sure. to the ESG uh, commentary. Uh, well, unfair. I was at a meeting I, last week of another, where I was serving another fiduciary con. Uh, uh, role and our counsel, a well-known LA lawyer, uh, started talking to us about a, a recent decision of the Delaware Supreme Court, which basically was saying that corporate boards should uh, have no obligation to consider ESG factors, uh, and their primary objective is the uh, producing maximization of returns for investors. And uh, that fellow thought that would be uh, over time begin to bear on uh, trust and other types of fiduciaries as well. Um, I mean, personally, I hope he's really wrong. But uh, <laughs> I, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I do. I, I think both Dulcina has some thoughts on that. Well, one is that you're not a corporate board. You're you know, you're a governmental entity. And right. You're a board and a stakeholder in, in the health of uh, the state of California. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly appropriate to take the effects of things like social factors into account if they are going to affect the long-term um, health of the state, which in turn will affect the long-term return of your funds. So, and I think your 21 risk factor policy is very clear about that connection mm -hmm. between sustainable investments uh, and your duties as fiduciaries to make sure that you have long-term sustainable investments. Well, and I think a board such as yours has a lot of choices in terms of investments and investment opportunities. And one of the things that you as a board would be considering is you know, the facts and circumstances around each investment and where the available return is comparable and the risk is comparable, you have the ability to consider other factors. And that's okay. clearly consistent with your fiduciary duty. So my last turn on this wheel is, uh, uh, one, we're largely passive investors, so to some extent this, these concerns may or may not be discounted in the markets, but we do have very dedicated ESG-related investment programs. So let's assume one of, or more of them lags in terms of performance for a period of time, but we think way out there, that's the place to be. How do we as fiduciaries square that? Uh, the uh, lagging performance and the uh, the added burden it puts in terms of getting our target return on our other investment programs. Well, my view is that you know you, like a lot of your counterparts, are long-term investors, and you have to look not only at short-term returns and things, but also you have to look at the long-term health of your investment program. And as a long-term investor, you are going to have things that sometimes don't perform the way you want them to. Um, right now, traditional fixed income is not the best place to be in the world, but you still have that component in your portfolio, and it's important. Well, uh, yeah, so let's just let me drill one last time, and then I'll let, let others talk. So let's assume you take 2 or 3% 
uh, let's assume it drags the portfolio by half a percent a year uh, for seven or eight years. And therefore means that the rest of the portfolio has, it, it, it imposes a higher rate of return in future years for us to meet our obligations. Uh, because the uh, losses or the subperformance in the early years of a long period of time, you know, weigh quite heavily on long-term results or disproportionately on them. How do we react to that <laughs> argument? Put simply, in a different context, if you have an investment that's uh, where, or an investment program where you're going to be negative for three years, four years, five years, and you're trying to make eight percent, then uh, for the five through ten years, you've got to make fourteen percent. Um, well, so me, applying that analogy so, uh, to the lagging port <laughs> program. Here's a question. So the um, the risk factor, the, the duty to you know select investments and to apply this duty of prudence, mm -hmm. uh, which we've been talking about, doesn't just apply when you select an investment. It also applies on an ongoing basis. So you're constantly looking at your portfolio mix to see uh, whether changes should be made. And in doing that, you have guidelines to follow, including the 21 risk factors, which you know, I keep talking about because that's what the ESG issue implicates. Um, but that policy also requires your investment consultants and your managers to consider the 21 factors when, they're making, when they come back with their recommendations. So I'm assuming then that when the past performance is a problem, that that will be taking into new account when your investment consultants come back, along with all the other, along with the 21 factors, and they, and they'll be will be providing a recommendation based on that analysis. Okay, right? that's good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, Thank you. So um, I'd like to follow up on the last comments on, in your prepared answer, uh, where <coughs> this board was talking about how if the decisions we make don't turn out to have good returns, if we have a good process that's documented as to how we came to that conclusion that, that you know, we're, we're, we're protected as, to, as having uh, carried out our fiduciary duty. So the, the question I have is, is you can always get somebody to give you a justification for what you want to do. I mean, we know that. You know, that's that's the world of consultants. <laughs> they get hired to, to to tell you to do what you want it, what you already want to do. I mean, we if if we wanted to to pursue an investment strategy, we could certainly put together a paper trail that says that we should do that, and we can get experts, and we can get professors, and we can get you know. So it seems to me it's we have a we have a responsibility that's more than just developing a paper trail. So how, how, would you, how would you advise us that the paper trail we put together was truly a legitimate weighing of all of the factors rather than just one constructed to enable us to do what we want to do? Well, ha haven't to some extent you already taken steps to address that possible risk? I mean, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've hired two independent investment consultants. That's correct. Right? Yes. Um, so there's only so much you can do. I mean, you're, you're going to get advice. When, in, when you're following your processes, you're going to get advice from your consultants. So, right? so because we have two independent general investment consultants, if we want to think about pursuing an ESG or sustainability agenda on our investments, we should, we should ask them for their advice? Well, what I, I brought up the two investment consultants because it appears to be something, a, a step you've taken to get a broader range of opinions and to um, you document the process and to really make sure you have a thorough, complete process. So again, as Dulce was saying, you're not prohibited from taking ESG concerns into account when you're making investments. Um, but well, let me ask you a question, though. Go ahead. 
So we do have two investment consultants. Yes. And there are general investment consultants. If we decide to consider a sustainability strategy in our investments, and we ask a, somebody else to advise us on that, and we don't ask the opinion of those two investment consultants, does that put us at some risk that we haven't considered the totality of what we need to consider? Because we've not asked the two firms that we have already engaged to give us general investment advice. There's no law that says you have to, you know, or, or that lists all the factors that you have to consider. Okay? What you have to have is a reasonable uh, process and consider relevant facts and circumstances. And I think getting the consultant's opinion on these matters is can be part of that process and probably should be part of that process. So I, I'm, are there situations that you foresee where you want to consult the investment consultant on investment decisions? I'm just asking because we, yeah. we, we don't know. We, we, haven't, we don't have the process in place. I assume that you engaged your two consultants to the board for a reason. And I'm assuming part of that reason had to be to have an independent voice, given the board advice, separate and apart from staff and other you know, consultants that you have for a particular asset class. So it would seem that if, that, if those assumptions are correct, that it would be advisable that you did consult, would, you did use the consultant for the purpose for which they were hired. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other board members that have a question? Uh, comments? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna jump in. And um, I'm going to uh, reference a paper entitled Reclaiming Fiduciary Duty <coughs> Balance. And it's co authored by Ed Weitzer, who is a professor of law at the School of Business at York University in Toronto. It's Reclaiming Fiduciary Duty Balance. I just want to get your views, your firm's view, on whether or not you agree with Mr. Weitzer's overarching philosophy on fiduciary duty in 2015. And he writes, um, the evolution of fiduciary duty demonstrates that fiduciary law is not a static concept, nor is it tied to a single investment theory. Weitzer argues that it's a flexible set of principles that have been subject to varying interpretations over time. And he concludes by saying, quote, trust investment law should reflect and accommodate current knowledge and concepts. It should avoid repeating the mistake of freezing its rules against future learning and development." End quote. Agree? Disagree? Why? Why not? It, it's fairly vague. I mean, it sure is. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit fuzzy, so it's hard to. I mean, it sounds good, you know. Yeah. Um, but one thing, you know, what's not static is the California Constitution. Uh, we know you have those rules. But I guess what's arguably, you could arguably, is, is dynamic is that how those rules apply um, can change with not only the world, the world is changing, but also, you know, occasionally you get case law out there that. Um, provides, puts more meat on the bone on what the rule means and, and what your responsibilities are. So yes, it's okay to evolve you know, along, with the, along with the world, which you've done in the past. I mean, you, you evolved when you decided to move, remove taco, tobacco from your um, funds. Um, and that, you know, changing the 20 risk factors to the 21 doesn't sound as good. But, um, so, but you always look back at, at the law. The law under the California Constitution, sets out certain fiduciary responsibilities. Again, how you interpret that law, it can evolve over time. So I, I don't know if that answered your question. Sounds like you not. agree with him. I'd have to read the whole paper to, <laughs> to really know what he's saying. <laughs> I, but that sentence sounded an reasonable. An it, yeah. sounded, it sounds reasonable. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that it's not static. You would agree with that? 
that Fiduciary. how you what your duties are and what your responsibilities are is set under the California Constitution. That we what do. that means in, in the real world is is not static; it's dynamic. Yeah, yeah. I think we're in agreement. You and I are in agreement. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else want to respond? If not. Um, You've got a couple of minutes just in terms of making sure that we have provided equal time to all firms. So um, I do see a, a colleague that's weighed in here, so we'll take his comments. Mr. Boykin. Took the cue. I'll fill some of the time. So I wondered if you could discuss a little bit about some of the engagements you've had with public plans in California, specifically um, advising them on fiduciary matters. Sure. I think Dulcie and I can both take that. Um, I. For, I've been involved in advising public entities of fiduciary matters for my entire career, um, which I, it's hard to believe, but it spans 17, 18 years at this point. Um, and it really has been a, a wide range of work that I've done. I mean, um, for example, in early in my career, writing research memos, you know, researching California law, uh, researching ERISA, applying those laws to uh, factual situations, and and then evolved over time. You know, over the last four or five years, the role has more been uh, has, has been to be more closely integrated with uh, the board, advising the board directly, and advising uh, or working with staff in some cases, which I understand that wouldn't be involved here. Um, but more specifically, uh, about probably spent. Oh, about 50% of my time advising fiduciary counsel um, over the last three or four years to public retirement plans in California. Yeah, I've primarily represented, represented public pension plans in California and elsewhere with respect to investment matters. But, you know, a big a part of that process is looking at, you know, fiduciary duties and including in fiduciary duties of staff as well as, as, well as boards. Um, it's mainly arisen in unfortunate circumstances uh, where the investment didn't quite perform the way it should have or when something bad happened with respect to a manager or something like that. But so I've had that experience, but not explicitly as fiduciary counsel, but it's more in the context of, of investment transactions. Thank you very much. Any other Um, you want to buzz back in, Ms. Hunterman, please? Yeah, it would be helpful if you could just give some specifics as to the engagements where you know, names of plans and types of matters. Sure. Um, over the last, uh, before joining Pillsbury, which is about two years ago, um, I spent a great deal of time advising a, a transportation district here in California, or here in Sacramento, called the Sacramento Regional Retirement District. Um, they maintain three plans, uh, three defined benefit plans, which face and, and which face very similar issues to what the Stures Board faces. But in addition to that, like most public entity plans, they um, are held responsible for obtaining the actuarial study and setting employer contributions. So that was also a big part of uh, the practice there, is advising on what actuarial assumptions mm -hmm. apply. What was your role? Were you the plan counsel? Fiduciary the fiduciary counsel. counsel. Ah, okay. Yeah. 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 And uh, we are fiduciary counsel to other smaller retirement plans in California. And also fiduciary counsel, as, as the group, we are fiduciary counsel to numerous large privately held companies throughout the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I, I primarily represent public pension plans, so, and they go from your friends across the river and at CalPERS to Los Angeles County to the Missouri teachers to the New York City plans. Mm -hmm. So quite a, quite a few plans across the country. Dulce, you, you work directly with the New York City yes. plans yourself? Yes. 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 We represent them on private equity and hedge funds and real estate. Any other questions or comments from my colleagues? If not, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for thank your you. response, and nice seeing everyone again. Brian? Thanks for my Danielle's going <laughs> to walk in the background. Sorry. I always forget that, too. She keeps going out. Oh. This guy's going to turn it over.
to like record a little bit more. So, Brian, will you uh, help us with the process here at this point? Uh, we, we go through deliberations. I assume, Ms. Yamani, we, we need to have um, at some point a motion and a second uh, to select the firm that we want to have service as fiduciary counsel. Is that correct? Okay, did I miss anything, uh, Brian? In terms of uh, process? No, uh, you, uh, you can, there are some terms you could talk, for example, the length of the contract is Jack. Reminded me, we, we saw it three years, but you know, if you want to instruct staff on any specific terms, but right now the, the deliberation is so that's just stated. two things here. One, uh, we'll, we will go through the process of uh, identifying whom it is that the board would like to serve as our fiduciary counsel. That would be need a, a motion, a second, uh, and then a vote. And I believe it's a roll call vote. Is that correct? For the, no, it's not a roll call for this. And then, no. and then, second, the second issue is then the terms and conditions if, of if the contract. Want. Some general guidance to the staff to negotiate those terms. I just remind uh, my colleagues and myself that we are live on the internet. Are we going to discuss that? Uh, Miss Dillon. Oh, did we want to? Do we want to do the uh, the last? We want to do the last group discussion. You want to? It just seems like it's better. Yeah. Do it for okay. Your yeah. Feedback on the last group. I think the presentation wasn't as good. I, I I finally figured out one of their problems of presentation, and that they are not. They haven't all been in Pillsbury for a long time, <laughs> and they yeah. can't talk about with specifics you can, unless you draw it out you things they did at other firms. Yeah. Um, and so that I think handicapped them. I thought <clears throat> as lawyers, they were frankly quite impressive. And Dulcie Brand uh, is somebody whose reputation, I've, I've only been on phone calls with her, uh, is just really sterling. Um, it's, but it's, she doesn't do what we're looking for. Uh, she is really a specialist in representing plans, dealing with uh, private equity and other sponsors. Uh, she's obviously a broader thinker than that, but she's one of the most distinguished people in the country in that field. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that means a lot to me uh, in our choice. Uh, mm -hmm. I thought uh, Marcus's presentation was a little bit mechanical, uh, but uh, he certainly is knowledgeable and uh, I thought technically very solid. I actually concur with you, uh, Tom, and I think it's interesting to look at the, um, to sometimes get beyond the presence that someone has in a room yeah. and really see beyond what's visible. Yeah. Any other <coughs> thoughts or comments? One thing I'd add is he, what he didn't convey is an ability to take the leadership role that I think we're looking for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That doesn't say that he couldn't, but he, he certainly didn't show it today. So for, for me on, on this issue, it's you want, I want that right balance. Right. Right. I don't want someone whose presence is so large, so big, so dominant that it consumes. The, the room, but I also want someone who's too passive. And so, how do you find the right balance? Uh, Betty? Um, I, I didn't feel like this last firm exuded any kind of um, sense of being proactive, I guess. I mean, it was um, kind of like the starting point for our policies and, you know, really not a view beyond kind of what's in front of them. And so, um, which doesn't give me a lot of comfort. I mean, there's a spectrum, and I would agree with you, not kind of taking out you know, over the whole atmosphere and uh, um, storming through, but I just, I, I didn't see um, kind of movement beyond, you know, just kind of how the table's set for them. Yeah. Joy? 
Um, you know, I think the comment that I would just make, and it's, um, I think it's just a, sort of a comment on the process that I'm not sure we can do anything about, but um, I agree that this firm's presentation may not have been as strong. I think they were, um, they were disadvantaged or other firms may have been advantaged by the fact that they have participated in our meetings, worked with us, right. worked with board members, worked with staff. I, I'm not sure that there's anything we can do about that to factor that in, but it's, um, you know, I think sort of getting back to Tom's point, if you get past that, I think that they're, they may have strong qualifications, but it's hard to judge whether, um, whether they would be able to, to step up and do it without, without being able to see in the future. Uh, that's a, a, a great point. I think the fact that you, you verbalize that, uh, that familiarity that we have with others, just acknowledging that um, is just, I think, common sense. Yeah. That that's it's familiarity that we have a sense of comfort sometimes. That and that they have with us. When they have with us, mm -hmm. exactly. So just acknowledging that, I think, is in of itself what we can do. Uh, Tom? Yeah, that said, I mean, one thing they didn't do is follow our meeting yesterday. Yes. And, uh, they didn't seem like they knew us very well. Huh? They didn't seem like they knew us very yeah, well. Yeah, I mean, they, they didn't do a Which lot of background know. checking. And, and that was part of, led to them being somewhat mechanical. Um, the, and it's pretty easy to have somebody on the internet watching <laughs> what, we, what we did yesterday, so. Dana? So, Brian, uh, it, what Joy brings up is something that uh, kind of haunts us frequently. Um, we hear that people don't necessarily even respond to the RFPs because we're very comfortable with who we have and how long we've had our arrangements with them and how familiar we are with each other and how well that works for us. Um, so that said, I know that we've had, I mean, one of the reasons why Harvey's familiar to us is because he's in a whole nother pool, correct? I mean, am I, is this the correct pool that I'm talking about that, that does work for us on a, on a regular basis and then has the opportunity to present to the board? Yes, actually, Harvey's firm is in two, two other representations. One is a pool that we use, if you will, as wraparound to the general counsel's office. So uh, we, uh, we started with Reed Smith back when we first started looking at the vested rights and the funding strategy, so they've worked with us. But Reed Smith also advises on the, uh, on the procurement for the uh, pension solution that they were uh, yeah. counsel for that, not not Harvey specifically, but some of right. his partners. So they, they do have quite a familiarity with us in our system. So then, uh, as a follow-up, um, how does a firm get into that pool? Pillsbury obviously is not part of that pool. Right, Pillsbury is not, so, so there are the, there are different pools. So, for example, we have a pool of investment counsel that we go through a process to establish. There is a, a request, uh, an RFI process, which is not a pool. So I, I'm, you're using a pool, and I was just going along with that. But they actually have representation relationships that we established on an ad hoc as needed basis. So we hired, uh, we, we had three firms look at some of our vested rights issues. They reported back. They put together a presentation. We presented it to you uh, in the furlough uh, instance. So Pillsbury was part of that? No, they were not. Pillsbury, okay. we have not used Pillsbury for anything before. So I, I guess what I'm trying to, if. if oh, oh, yeah, that's, uh, there was, we did, we used them, I think just before I came on board for okay. a personnel uh, matter, that they looked into something for us. Okay. So, um, because they were one of the three finalists and they responded to the RFP, they must want to do business with us. Yes, very much so. In the event that they are not selected, they have the opportunity to try to get into that pool? Yeah, or what we, I'm calling a pool, for lack of a better term? Yeah. We, the, you know, if, we, uh, if, we're, if we're impressed, if they have the right credentials, if they're right, uh, the, the right skills that we need for a legal uh, Item, yes. Um, when we have, we do pools for long term, so we have investment council pools, but sometimes we hire counsel on the short term 
So when we have something that needs to be addressed right away, um, so, um, you Thank know, you. whether or not we reach out to them would be just oh. whether or not they have the skill set. Last question, because some of the, I mean, I know comments, not necessarily on this consultant, but other consultants that we have. Um, I know a comment's been made that there's really good firms out there that don't bother. So were there good firms that didn't bother to respond to this RFP? I think, I, I, I think we had about, so we sent out contacts with, with Napa, which Chelsea talked about. Uh, we uh, used your board governance consultant to provide other contact. We actually got responses from, I think, 23 different firms uh, to who requested an interest in the RFI. In other words, send us the, 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 uh, the information for us to respond to. So then uh, we got back, I believe, 11 responses out of those 23. Now, why the selection was, some of it was they didn't have the knowledge of California law. They didn't have the breadth. You heard that mentioned today. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we requested in the RFI was some breadth on investments. A lot of folks who do this business don't have the, the thank you, don't have the breadth on investments. And so they, and they self-selected them out of the, right, out of the right, process. Right, right, right. So then out of the 11, then we had one withdraw, and then we went through the process, and we, and we had 10 good five. firms to come up with. And so um, it's just kind of the process of, uh, you know, winnowing them down. But uh, going through Napa pretty much catches most of this industry. But, right. but the most important driver, Dana, in the pool this time was your decision on the minimum qualifications. Yep. Is that telegraphed to the pool that there, you were not going to have an incumbent? I mean, that changes everything. Right. So. All right. Thank you. Anyone else have comments about the uh, last firm? That process. Okay, seeing none. So now we'll go to uh, the deliberations and uh, selection of our uh, next fiduciary council. So open up the floor. Mr. Unterman. Yeah, I, I guess I'm, I'm not shy. Um, <laughs> I would be comfortable with either Reed Smith or Pillsbury. I would prefer Reed Smith, um, but be comfortable that we're getting good counsel from either. But as I said, prefer Reed Smith for more a sense that Harvey would really engage on the level we want, want him to. Okay. Sharon? Ms. Hendricks? So I would, I would move that we hire Reed Smith. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to retain Reed Smith as the board's fiduciary counsel. We'll open that up for discussion. Sounds like a good idea. I think we discussed <laughs> it. <laughs> no, I don't, think, I don't think we have. Okay. Not, not to the point of taking a vote yet. I'm okay. just okay. going to look around the room to make sure that. Sure. Okay, then we will. We yeah, will. Else well, no. Well, you, you want if you want discussion, we yeah, can have discussion. Yeah, we can talk more. I mean, I don't. Well, maybe, I don't yeah. feel a need for discussion. I think we've had okay. a fair amount of discussion about each of the firms as they okay. came up. Uh, I okay. I agree with I agree with with Tom's um, viewpoint. Uh, I'm. I, I think we've seen enough and discussed enough to be able to to um, to take a vote, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I'm comfortable. Okay, okay. it's just. No, I got the you. way they trained me was. I got it, Mr. Shaw. You got it. Motion, a, second, got discussion. Man. You're the man. That's right. We we are lucky. Okay, so. so. Eddie looks like he's about ready to say something. Eddie, did you want to weigh in? I just said I wanted to take the opportunity to first. Sure. First, I want to thank um, Joy, Harry, others, and obviously Tom Brown, Brian for the work. Well, that they put in yeah. getting us to this point, but um, was there anything I guess in the process leading up to this that maybe wasn't readily apparent before us today? Good question. But, You, weigh in. Um, it, you know, I guess I guess what I would say is I'm I'm just, you know seeing going through this process today. I'm still very comfortable with the results of our preliminary screening in terms of having brought who we thought were the three most qualified for the board to meet with. So I'm you know I, th I think the process worked worked well. Um, you know I think there is still maybe in the in the long term 
some issues for us to think about in the future, whether on this fiduciary council or others, are there other things that we can do to, um, to continue to attract the right caliber of firms mm -hmm. that we, we want? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Rosenstiel? Yeah, and I do have one question, some, some clarification, Brian, because I, I, I wasn't sure whether the pool or whatever it is that would enable Pillsbury to work with us, is that, is that something that's open at any time that they can present their qualifications? I mean, for example, the, the state treasurer's office uh, has an underwriter pool, and while they, they require people to resubmit every few years, anybody at any time can submit to that pool. So... So I'm, I'm sorry, the, the use of the word pool is, is a little confusing. So we have a pool for investments, but if, if, uh, if a plaintiff shows up at your door with a summons, I do an RFI and hire the best lawyer at that moment for that job. So that's why we have used these folks before. So there's a, we, we've used them on a particular instance for particular work, we've been satisfied with their work, and it's on it's on a task basis, as a, as as I said, sort of like a wraparound. So if we have additional like vested rights issues before we have we have firms that have expertise on that, and that's actually how we ended up working with Reed Smith and with Olson Hagel, and then uh, Olson Hagel also because Chris Waddell uh, has a lot of background and a lot of experience, which you heard. Uh, we decided, or I decided to have independent counsel represent the appeals committee so there would be no dispute about whether or not there was an improper influence or, or with the general counsel for the ethical wall. So there is no, there is no pool per se uh, when we use the exception to the uh, competitive bid process for the hiring of counsel. Okay. I guess I'm, I'm just, I, I think, you know, several members of the board, including me, were impressed with with, with Pillsbury, and if we're going to consider the motion to hire somebody else, uh, can, can we, uh, is, is Pillsbury being given these opportunities? Well, certainly, I think. we certainly will. Uh, okay. I certainly will. So the I, I don't feel, I don't I was, sense any opposition. I think what you're no. hearing, Brian, is, is to the extent that yeah. opportunities for Pillsbury to be engaged by your, your office. We were, I, I sense there's a direction that the board would like to yeah. get, have them have some presence and exposure to, to us Good. and to, to the work that your, your office does. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thanks absolutely. very much. I was impressed with them as well. Yeah. Uh, the motion on the floor before we take the vote, Mr. Zeiger, you will take so, the vote. So I have, a, I have a question that hasn't come up. I noticed that their fee structures are all substantially different. Rich, can and we can we address the fee structure after we take the vote? Because I think we can give direction around the contract negotiations. Do you want to do that? Or is that well, that was the question. The okay. question is, do we have some opportunity to have a conversation with them about that? Yeah, it's going to be the second part of the. Could I? Yeah, I ahead, just Brian. want to add one. One that was actually a question that we pointedly asked. Right. Uh, when we did our selection. Uh, Why don't you tell us the question? The, the exact question, question we asked. The question was. Are you, uh, are you open to alternative fee arrangements, such as set fees, task fees, or other types of fees? And I think that's important to remember because depending upon the level of, of engagement that you want, let's say, uh, so for example, I heard someone say, we're going to sit at every board meeting. I heard someone else say, we're going to provide you with a memo before every board meeting. So we want to try and get that into some sort of fee arrangement that is not just an hourly by the meter. So we, right. we but they all, they all voiced very clearly that they were open to alternative fee arrangements. That's, that's fine. There's some, I mean, I, I, there's some things you shouldn't buy low bid. <laughs> Brain surgery, <laughs> yeah, nuclear power plants, <laughs> and probably fiduciary councils. <laughs> so, but I, but I do, I, I was sort of impressed at how, um, divergent they were and was wondering if we'd have a chance to deal with that issue. Thanks, Rich. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll call the question. Motion on the floor is to retain Reed Smith as our primary fiduciary counsel to the board. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Seeing none, that motion passes. 
Uh, I'd like to give some direction and colleagues can weigh in or uh, in terms of negotiations, just in a general, an umbrella. Uh, I, I guess Could I just mention something on, on contract length? Sure. Uh, most of our contracts here are about five years, usually with a core period of three years and then renewals of one additional, but they can be terminated at any time, so that's never an issue. Uh, so I guess my counsel would be it, it's better to have a little bit longer contract so you don't force yourselves to do this in two years. If you do a three-year contract, you're going to be back with a half-day exercise, no matter what, whether you like them or not. Um, but if you do offer those options, at least you've got the door open to a longer time period if you're in a satisfactory relationship. It's really, in my mind, it's more about managing your time than it is about the message to the vendor. That'd be my take. Okay. Do you have a different take? Yes, I don't, I don't agree at all. I think that you should have a, a, a fixed term of three years and then bring it back. The board changes. There's... You know, there's opportunity. I don't think any of you uh, don't want to engage in this process. So, um, I, the the three year renewable at two single years that's just kind of that's awkward for me. I just don't know what that means. That uh, I just prefer a fixed term term contract. But that's just that's my opinion. It's not legal advice. That was here, just here. my opinion, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we do rely on those heavily. So we just want to give some general guidance. Uh, there would be an ob obvious compromise right there. It would be four. Four years fixed. It would be the solution. Can, Tom. Can, can, I, my question was, can, can we do, could we do a five-year fix? With, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. You can do anything So are you, you suggesting you that, Tom? Want. Yeah, it's five-year fix, but we can terminate it at any time? Right. Yes, any all of our contracts so work that way. So why don't we go with that, yes. a five-year fix yes. with uh, clear language of termination uh, at any time. Uh, obviously, we want you to use every opportunity you can. They, they were on the record in that interview that they, around fee structure, et cetera. We, we trust and, uh, and we'll verify that you've done everything you possibly can to minimize the cost. I would only ask, and I don't know where my colleagues are on this, we have, uh, we've had exposure with uh, Harvey. We know Harvey. Uh, I, I don't think there's any downside to us having more time in front of Sandra and getting to know Sandra a little bit. I think she brings a different uh, presence in the boardroom. Uh, there's the obvious difference be, uh, between the two of them, and, and that is the gender difference. And I, I do think that is something, you know, it's it's it's... it's we, we, we embrace diversity. We want to see, uh, um, you know, yeah. d uh, diversity in front of us. And uh, our, our fund is 70% uh, of our teachers are women. And uh, so I, I, I think it, we, it, it will enrich our experience. So to the extent that that can happen, uh, that that's possible, and my colleagues are not opposed to that, I would urge that uh, that message be delivered. Uh, no slight to Mr. Lieberman. We, we enjoy him. We know him. We, we want to grow in, in our experience with him. But uh, my point is pretty clear. Um, and obviously, that might incur a little additional cost relative to travel, but it's de minimis. So get that? Yes. Thanks. Right. Mr. Archman? Um, just to be sure, in the contract, we want to cover uh, the expanded role that we've been talking about in terms of shaping agenda, uh, guiding on agenda, vetting board material in advance, commenting to us on that, uh, understanding that there's an expense to that, but uh, the way I think of it is providing the sort of staff support that a board would otherwise I independently get. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it makes the engagement bigger, but it, it uh, I, I think it's very important that that be explicit. Absolutely. Any other general guidance? Okay, seeing none, we're going to break for lunch. Is that right? Is, we're going to lunch now? Yeah. And we'll reconvene at uh, 1 o'clock? That, how's that sound? If that works for you, that's great. Okay, so yeah. we'll come back at 1. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.